is the director of the Earth Institute, the Quitlet Professor of Sustainable Development, Professor of uh, Health Policy Management at Columbia University. Uh, before then, uh, uh, he spent over 20 years at Harvard University, most, recent as, uh, most recently as director of the Center for International Development uh, and uh, uh, the Gallenstone Professor of International Trade. Um, he is a special advisor to the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the Millennium Development Goals, but he had similar positions under uh, um, former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. Uh, he's director of uh, UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, co-founder of Strategies of Millennium, Promise Alliance, and director of Millennium Villages Project, and many other, many other things. So we are really uh, impressed, uh, uh, Jeff, at the number of uh, things you, you managed to do, and you even find the time uh, to, to uh, uh, spend one hour with us uh, uh, for, for a chat on, uh, on uh, the... Uh, um, uh, sustainable uh, development goals and, and the climate change in that, in that context. I was myself at the summit uh, in, uh, in New York. I, I spoke late at night because international regional organizations were put at the bottom of the list, but I made a point of staying in the room until uh, uh, my time came and, uh, and uh, showing that we do pay attention and we want to contribute as a regional organization under the UN Charter. We feel that there is a role for us. Uh, so I, I would maybe start from there, uh, the, the sustainable development agenda. Uh, there, there are many things that are relevant for us even as a, as a uh, regional security organization. Uh, um, we, we see that sustainable development can promote peace. Uh, uh, certainly we need to invest uh, in, those, uh, in all those areas. But we need, first of all, to increase the awareness uh, for the for the challenges that we, are, that we are facing and the importance of this, uh, of this agenda for peace and stability also in our region. Uh, so working on the implementation, I think, is the next, uh, uh, is the next uh, priority for us. And we will have to focus and to try to see in which areas the organization, as a regional organization, can provide a contribution. Now, as we are discussing climate change, and we had already a number of presentations where we see that in various regions of the OSC, and where presentations of uh, very high-level speakers from Central Asia, from the Caucasus, uh, from Southeast Europe, we see that climate change is an issue. It is affecting uh, lives. Uh, it is affecting security of countries. It is perceived already by many as a major security risk for the countries. Uh, so how, how do you see now COP21 COP coming up? Uh, how do you see the preparations and what, where do you see the main challenges? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for uh, having me. And I'm, of course, absolutely delighted and honored to be with you. And please count on me uh, in, in any way to uh, help uh, your very, very important work. First, let me say a word, if I can, about the sustainable development goals themselves. We have a worldwide agreement, which is a very rare thing indeed. So when we have it, we should use it. Uh, and this is an agreement adopted on September 25th to put sustainable development uh, at the center of global diplomatic cooperation for uh, our overall economic and environmental cooperation. It's a big deal. The sustainable development goals were three years in the making. Uh, they do have a global consensus. There is a lot of interest in them in governments around the world. I was in China last week, and China was hosting, uh, at the event that I was at, a dozen education ministers from the Asia-Pacific region. The host was uh, the deputy prime minister. When she spoke, uh, she uh, laid out China's agenda by saying that the new sustainable development goals uh, would be the organizing principle for China's international cooperation and its internal efforts on development in the coming generation. And then every one of the dozen education ministers put the sustainable development goals at the center of his or her speech. To my mind, this is uh, already a sign that there is some uh, reality to this very new, fresh global agreement. Uh, to make sure that everybody is uh, on the same track, the SDGs are 
to operate for the period January 1, 2016 to December 31st, 2030. In other words, it's a 15-year period. There are 17 sustainable development goals. I encourage everybody to, to learn them. Uh, they cover the three fields of sustainable development, meaning economic development, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. To my mind, uh, 17 was uh, a little bit too big a number because it's uh, not a simple number of goals, but it's a manageable number. But also, to my mind, these 17 sustainable development goals are very uh, important and, and well put, in fact. This is a good document. It's workable. It introduces uh, ambitious uh, but a sensible integrated agenda for the development processes for countries all over the world. It is, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which focused on the poorest countries, the Sustainable Development Goals are a universal agenda. They're to apply to Europe and the United States, the high-income world, as well as the uh, middle-income developing countries and the low-income countries. Every country, in other words, is to take on the Sustainable Development Goal challenges in ways that are appropriate. Now, you mentioned uh, regional organizations. There is, in my view, no conceivable way that these Sustainable Development Goals can be achieved on a country-by-country -country basis. Uh, at a minimum, regional cooperation on sustainable infrastructure and sustainable economic integration is essential. And of course, for some of the goals, like the climate change agenda, this is truly a global scale problem and a global scale uh, challenge that requires uh, global scale cooperation. Europe by itself or the United States by itself or Asia by itself cannot solve the climate change challenge, which is indeed extremely severe. We need true global scale cooperation. So the OSCE, to my mind, has a, an extremely pertinent role to play in the overall sustainable development agenda and in the climate change agenda specifically. Uh, if you look at the countries of the o OSCE, of course, not only is there a lot of tension right now, but there is a tremendous uh, range of economic challenges. Uh, there are huge inequalities uh, and, and uh, differences of uh, um, economic and social condition. And there are huge differences in environmental vulnerabilities as well. Uh, so taking an integrated uh, vision of the OSCE members uh, is extremely important. We also know from current experience and from climate modeling and uh, other scientific evidence that uh, many, many countries in the OSCE region are incredibly vulnerable to the uh, already uh, progressing climate and environmental changes more generally. Let me mention in particular southern Europe is uh, and the Middle East and North Africa are extraordinarily vulnerable in particular not only to the warming but to the drying phenomenon that is underway. Uh, the Mediterranean basin and the Middle East are in almost every climate assessment subject to increasing drought uh, and uh, general drying conditions and a very high vulnerability to mega droughts, which mean 10-year drought episodes in the 21st century. This is extraordinarily dangerous. And one thing to say about the climate agenda in general is that while it has three components, mitigation of the human impacts by moving to a decarbonized energy system, resilience to reduce uh, the vulnerabilities, and 
disaster preparedness and relief to adjust to specific high impact shocks. If we don't mitigate the human impacts, in other words, if we don't head off the current path and go to a much lower overall impact, we're never going to be able to manage this crisis merely by making societies more resilient or even less by addressing emergencies after they occur. So from my point, from my point of view, the number one agenda is decarbonizing the world energy system so that we don't have the worst of the climate change impacts. Of course, saying that, we need to recognize that decarbonization will be a process of decades, not of individual years. So not only do we need a long-term strategy, but we have to face the reality that we're so late in this process that there's going to be a lot of climate change, even if we now do the right thing on moving to decarbonization. So these second and third elements of the climate agenda, which is resiliency and responding to uh, emergencies is uh, also on the agenda. The final thing uh, before I uh, return uh, to you uh, is that we already know that uh, these ecological shocks are of first order current significance. I think there's no doubt and probably you've already discussed it today that the Syria crisis, which is uh, one of the most serious flashpoints in the whole world, is itself a, a mix of geopolitics, local politics, but also of ecological uh, derangement. Syria has been in a long-term <coughs> drying phase, and it experienced a massive, unprecedented drought uh, in the period after 2005. And this was definitely one of the factors that led to population displacement internally, unrest, and eventually uh, a spiraling of repression and then violence, and now the uh, full-scale war that has been underway for a number of years. It's not the only factor very rarely will ecological shocks be the only thing at play in a complex environment. But I think we can say that drought has been a contributing factor to the Syrian crisis. And that's reason enough for us to be moving with far more urgency than we have in the past. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And in fact, as we are uh, starting also here in the OSC to have a bit of a debate, and at least an analysis on this uh, phenomena of massive migration, in fact, the, the climate uh, uh, angle of it, the climate change angle of it, in fact, uh, starts becoming visible, even though, as you say, it's uh, one of the causes, obviously. But over time, it might, as you mentioned, also progressive uh, desertification in uh, in some parts of Northern Africa and the Middle East, uh, we might see more, more of that as, as uh, having an impact. But I wanted to come to another uh, angle, uh, after which I would open also the floor for the, the uh, um, participants here to, uh, to uh, um, raise their questions. And, and that has to do with uh, uh, the costs of these policies and uh, also the degree of, uh, how can I say, adherence and acceptance of countries to uh, uh, and I would put it in the, in the broader context uh, to the, the, uh, uh, the sustainable development agenda, but ob obviously climate change its policies, where you have to invest a lot up front uh, uh, in terms of po po policies that may be unpopular or costly at a time where budgets are tight, and we see it also in the context of our own budget discussion here these days. Uh, and, uh, and where the results will be uh, seen on a long term. So the ones who invest are not the ones who may benefit from, from the results of this. And of course the usual issue of the differential uh, uh, degrees of uh, development of the countries uh, with some uh, arguing that we need uh, you know, uh, uh, policies that are more flexible for us to be able to catch up with the others. Uh, so how, uh, how do you see the, the challenges on that front, the costs of the agenda? Let, let me uh, focus on uh, the climate mitigation uh, as one part of it and then say a few words about the more general question of the costs of achieving sustainable development generally. If we look at the uh, energy question, 
uh, as uh, the core of the climate uh, mitigation question, we have to face uh, some basic uh, parameters and some basic uh, facts. Currently, fossil fuels constitute uh, roughly 75% of the primary energy for the world economy. We remain 200 years after the steam engine came online a fossil fuel based world economy. And I think it is fair to say that fossil fuels built the world economy. Without coal, oil and gas, we wouldn't have a modern economy. And the coal, oil and gas sector is therefore very deeply enmeshed in uh, our entire uh, economic structure in uh, industrial sectors, certainly in transport, which is completely fossil fuel, almost completely fossil fuel based uh, in uh, the uh, building stock and uh, heating and cooling sectors and so forth. We are a fossil fuel world society. Now, we have come to understand that the emissions of carbon dioxide that come from burning fossil fuels, which amount to more than 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year, emitted worldwide through fossil fuel use, has come to constitute a, an emergency for the world. Uh, and that is because carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas. And at the rate that it is accumulating in the atmosphere, we will be on a trajectory to have a rise of temperature compared to the pre-industrial uh, averages for the planet of uh, well over three degrees Celsius and with some probabilities uh, over four, five or even six degrees Celsius. So far the warming has been 0.9 of one degree Celsius and it's already destabilizing. But if we reach beyond two degrees Celsius, and certainly if we reach three or four or five degrees Celsius in human-induced warming, we're going to face uh, disturbances and dislocations vastly larger than anything we can imagine really right now. Uh, many parts of the world will become virtually uninhabitable. Uh, they certainly will lose the capacity to grow food. Uh, and uh, water stress and extreme storms uh, will be uh, our daily visitation. So it's extraordinarily dangerous, the business as usual trajectory. Now the science is also uh, quite clear and uh, unforgiving. Uh, and that is that we have very little atmospheric room left for absorbing more human induced carbon dioxide. The estimates of the scientists uh, is roughly the following, that we have about uh, 900 billion tons of cumulative carbon dioxide emissions remaining to give us still a two-thirds probability of staying below two degrees Celsius warming. If we cumulatively emit more than 900 billion tons of CO2, in the future during the 21st century, we become essentially odds on to exceed the two degrees Celsius. The problem is that we're emitting at a rate of more than 30 billion tons currently, meaning that the uh, remaining carbon budget, as it's usually uh, described, is under 30 years at the current rate. Now, this is, <laughs> unfortunately, rather calamitous news because what we're called upon to do worldwide is to shift decisively to low carbon energy. And the mechanisms to do that are to uh, mobilize uh, solar power, wind power, nuclear energy, uh, maybe carbon capture and sequestration technology vast improvements of energy efficiency and shifting basic technologies to electrification away from direct uh, burning of fossil fuels, especially 
in our transport sector where we need to move to electric and fuel cell vehicles and away from internal combustion engine vehicles. The time is very short for this. And you ask about the politics of it, it's extremely difficult. And I think the first rule is that any country that owns fossil fuels is resistant because what they are being called upon to do is to accept the reality that they cannot use the fossil fuels that they have, uh, use them either internally or through exports. And so this is a significant hit to fossil fuel countries. And within Europe, you see big resistance, for example, in Poland, in the new government that was just voted in, uh, which is absolutely resistant to the climate change agenda because Poland has a coal sector. And in the United States, there has been big resistance uh, because of the importance of the oil industry in the U.S. political economy. Uh, the same has been true in uh, Australia and uh, Canada and the Middle East. So it, it's not uh, rocket science to understand the uh, kind of divisions uh, that are faced. You mentioned all of them. First are the powerful interests, which are among the most powerful interests on the whole planet in uh, political economy, and that's the oil, gas, and coal economy. Uh, they influence or even control governments all over the world. Uh, second is uh, the fact that what is required here are long-term solutions for short-term politicians. That's very tough. Our political systems are geared to an election cycle, hopefully, uh, and our problems are long-term. And reconciling long-term realities with short-term political cycles has so far proved to be beyond our reach on many, many problems, including this one. And then third is that countries are highly uh, differentiated in their vulnerability to climate change. Uh, some countries could even be net beneficiaries, though probably not, but some are going to be devastating losers. And the ones that will lose first are the warmer, drier parts of the world and the places that are more exposed to extreme storms, especially tropical cyclones. So we're already seeing North Africa and the Middle East and Southern Europe uh, bearing a heavy burden. We're already seeing uh, tropical Southeast Asia and the Caribbean bearing a heavy burden. By the way, Mexico was hit by the strongest tropical cyclone in recorded history in the Eastern Pacific and the uh, Caribbean this past week. That's really saying something. The strongest storm ever recorded in the Eastern Pacific and the Caribbean. And of course, uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines was the strongest typhoon. Uh, that means a tropical cyclone in the Indian Ocean ever recorded. And so this is already hitting the places that are most vulnerable. and. We're not psychologically or politically equipped for this right now. And uh, our governments are saying, don't come to us for financing. We already have big problems of retirement and pensions and health care. Uh, and now refugees don't come for aid. <laughs> and so there's a kind of unreality uh, about a lot of this. Uh, but nature is pretty unremitting in, in the messages that it's sending. Thank you. Anybody here questions for Professor Sachs? Please, uh, can you go to the microphone, introduce yourself, please? <clears throat> Professor. Yes. We here today rightly are looking towards Paris. Who is looking beyond Paris. I'm a military man, I'm a military planner, and militaries look at threats to the side upon their future actions. They then give these suggestions and considerations to government, and as you correctly said, the short-term political four-year cycle. Climate change is an unprecedented global problem requiring an unprecedented global solution. 
which in turn requires global leadership. Who is going to give us global leadership? Thank you very much. And uh, let, me, uh, let, let me say to uh, the, the military, uh, push back, because uh, I think the message from the military to the political leaders has to be, we can't solve this problem. <laughs> don't, don't send the army to uh, solve climate change or don't depend on us to keep the peace uh, if you can't keep a, a safe physical environment. It's quite interesting in the United States, uh, probably the clearest statements about the strategic risks have come from the national intelligence community uh, in various uh, future assessments looking at 2025, 2030. We have uh, very clear statements by the national intelligence community of how destabilizing these shocks are. But the politicians who usually are rather responsive to the intelligence community hasn't been listening because their campaign contributors are the oil sector. Uh, and so they're listening to uh, those who are paying for their next campaign rather than to uh, the reality that is being told to them by the intelligence community, which is, watch out, we're heading towards uh, extremely serious problems. Now, my sense is that there is growing uh, recognition among the political leadership that while they hate this issue, because they really do, it, it's just from a politician's point of view, probably the least pleasant issue they could face. It's all bad news and it's all long term. Um, they understand that this is uh, extremely serious. And at the G7, uh, led by uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, in June, the G7 stated pretty clearly that uh, the world needs to fully decarbonize in the 21st century. That's quite a strong statement, actually, that the leadership made. Uh, and President Obama, who faces incredible opposition uh, from the oil lobby in the United States uh, and therefore from the Republican Party in the United States, has been pushing relatively hard on this. I think in China, which is, of course, the number one emitting country in the world by far now, China is responsible for uh, twice the emissions of the United States. Uh, the leadership in China is also coming to understand how strategically important this is for China. Not only has China taken the place of the United States as being the number one cause of global climate change, which isn't a comfortable position to be in. But of course, China itself is being racked by uh, climate shocks and by massive air pollution, which is really deadly at this point. It's so severe uh, from the coal uh, burning that uh, I expect in the upcoming 13th plan, which China is now unveiling this week at the plenum and then uh, will adopt next year, that there will be a significant change, of course. So at one level, we do have leadership in the United States, China, and the European Union that says this is very serious. When I uh, give talks in, in, uh, to ambassadors in the General Assembly, I find a very strong uh, global uh, worry about this issue. There are no climate deniers left uh, at the political level. Um, there are some governments, uh, I mentioned Poland is one, which push back on this agenda because of uh, domestic interests. But the world knows this is quite dangerous. But we don't have the institutions to resolve this properly. My view is that what we need to do at Paris and beyond is to put in place longer term planning mechanisms. What I've tried to emphasize in the lead up to Paris is the need for an agreement among the countries for putting forward not only short term goals to 2030, but medium term strategies, at least to the year 2050. Even if those strategies are not legally binding, I believe that every country should put forward what I call a pathway of deep decarbonization. 
And in the recent agreement between uh, President Obama and President Xi Jinping, uh, they said in paragraph six of their communique in September that both countries would put forward medium-term scenarios of how they plan to achieve deep decarbonization. We need to build institutions now that are longer term and that are beyond the political cycle. And politicians should welcome that kind of institution building to say it's not our, it's not our fault and it's not our choice. We have to be on a longer term path. And this, I believe, requires new institutional design, not simply uh, signing pieces of paper. And the best that I've been able to come up with, it's a pretty weak uh, step, but I think it's an important one. Uh, and that is uh, to get in Paris an agreement in the final document that every country will put forward a, not legally binding, but put forward a pathway of deep decarbonization so that that country does its own homework of understanding this issue. And second, uh, that it uh, has the domestic political will to explore this problem in a transparent way, to tell its citizenry and its companies, we are going all the way to deep decarbonization and eventually in this century to full decarbonization. One more thing I'd like to mention for the OSCE region. If we are going to decarbonize, the only way to do it is through an integrated energy system. The wind blows in the North Sea, but the needs uh, for electricity are not necessarily there. The sun shines uh, in uh, the North Africa and the Middle East but the high energy demands are not necessarily there. And when the wind blows, the sun may not be shining, and when the sun is shining, the wind may not be blowing. And so with intermittent energy, we need an integrated grid that can uh, smooth the uh, shocks of any particular source. So we should be moving to an integrated energy system. Instead, like so many things, we have energy nationalism, which says we're not going to have an integrated energy system. Of course, countries are worried about energy blackmail, about uh, energy supplies being cut, about depending on unstable regions. But my opinion is quite different, which is that if we want peace, we should have an integrated dependency. And if we want uh, low carbon energy, we need an integrated system. And this would also make good economic sense. It's absolutely a shame, for example, that Greece is in such a profound economic crisis when Greece could be selling a lot of wind power and a lot of solar power to Germany if there were an interconnector and an integrated European energy strategy. We have neither. We don't have a grid that covers Europe, nor is there truly a European strategy. And in the economic discussions over the last five years, many times I've proposed uh, increasing Greece's energy, renewable energy exports to Europe through EIB financing. So get the uh, European Investment Bank to finance a regional grid. But Germany has been very resistant to this, for example, because of energy nationalism. But then, interestingly, Germany isn't even completing the grid within Germany because of resistance within Lander uh, that say we don't want high-voltage uh, power lines over our heads carrying North Sea wind to Bavaria. And so everywhere we're impacted by political barriers to what we really need to do for our true security. In the OSC and listening to you, uh, I was just, just uh, sort of uh, reflecting on the approach we have to security in the OSC, which is based on soft security and confidence building. Now we managed to contribute overcoming uh, ideological divides in the past uh, by developing this agenda based on uh, uh, the notion of trying to build trust uh, to show the common into where the common interests are. So uh, would a, 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 an approach based also on confidence building measures, uh, would it be able, you think, to, to help 
uh, overcome these uh, nationalisms of, uh, uh, of energy, for instance? I, I think it's essential, and I think that uh, doing this uh, partly by uh, shorter-term measures of uh, trust and confidence and partly by a, an OSCE-wide engagement in low-carbon energy security would be extremely valuable. Uh, because uh, if you did OSCE-wide planning, uh, then the interdependencies of the different regions would become more clear. We constantly, uh, in everyday life and in all of the security issues that you face, we're constantly uh, at a uh, choice between confrontation and cooperation. Uh, and of course, the OSCE is built on the concept that the cooperation is the positive sum approach to all of this, which I think is the fundamental truth for us. If we end up in a, any kind of new Cold War on the Ukraine border or uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the uh, South China Sea, we're never going to solve these problems of sustainable development because two things will happen. One, our attention and our resources are going to be diverted from long-term solutions to short-term crises, and we're never going to have the resources to do this. So that's one problem. The second problem is that the true solutions are regional. Uh, that's a, a matter of the technology and of the resource base. In other words, we need an integrated approach of North Africa, the Middle East, Russia, uh, European Union, to have the kind of uh, energy system that will work for the 21st century. And so it's not only a matter of diverting resources to conflict, which in the end, uh, of course, doesn't solve our problems, but it's also a fact that there is no solution at a, at a national level or a subnational level of course, some distributed energy and local solutions make sense, but we absolutely need regional solutions as well, transnational, regional scale solutions, especially in an integrated uh, power distribution system. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> That's very encouraging from our perspective in terms of, uh, of uh, defining a role that we can you know, take on to support the implementation of this broad agenda. Who else uh, wants to intervene in this, in this interesting debate? I think uh, people got a bit uh, intimidated and uh, worried at your, <laughs> at your comments, Professor Sarr. No, no. <laughs> Please. Uh, le le let me then touch on another uh, element, the, the local level. And uh, it is there the, the, the impact of climate change is felt the most, and local communities and local, local people more exposed to the effects. And uh, do you see room also for bottom-up approaches involving uh, civil society? Uh, the OSC, in a way, is good at mobilizing network of, of civil society and, and uh, uh, try to, uh, how can I say, engage with the, you know, the public in, the, in, in our countries. Uh, wh what's your advice on that, and how, how do you see this? I, I think one thing that is extremely important is for people everywhere to understand what the vulnerabilities are, not only in general terms and at a global scale, but also locally, since uh, the vulnerabilities differ in different regions. And uh, one of the things that we lack on all of this, because we're trying to give imagination for future choices, uh, which is very hard to do, of course, um, is for tools to help uh, people everywhere, city governments, metropolitan areas, to understand what are the risks and what are actions that need to be taken locally within the context of uh, global cooperation. So at a global scale, it's right to say that we need to decarbonize the energy system. This is clear. At a global and regional scale, it's right to say we need integrated energy security uh, strategies, uh, as I was describing. At a local level, it's also clear to say we need local actions, uh, both for public understanding and acceptability.
availability of uh, alternative choices, uh, whether it's uh, public transport choices or local acceptance of uh, alternative uh, energy or efficiency uh, choices and so forth. But most regions face real uh, resiliency problems uh, that need to be addressed. So every uh, part of the world should be asking the question, given what will happen uh, on climate change globally, what does that mean for my uh, city, uh, my uh, part of the world, my farm, uh, and so forth? In New York City, it means uh, bigger storms and rising sea levels. Uh, and so our uh, recent two mayors have, uh, after we had a super storm in 2012, put on the agenda uh, a $20 billion uh, remediation uh, program for reducing uh, flood risks. Well, $20 billion is uh, a hefty price tag. Uh, even for New York City, um, and, and it hasn't been accomplished yet. And so this has to be worked out locally, uh, because uh, ultimately a lot of the financing is going to take place locally. Uh, if you are in the Middle East and you know that there's going to be uh, increasing water stress, we should be having uh, regional solutions. Uh, if, in addition to the complete mess of the Israel-Palestine uh, politics, which is uh, a disaster right now, um, if there was actually sensible discussion of Egypt, Palestine, Israel, Jordan, uh, on managing the watershed uh, of the Jordan River and uh, joint desalin desalination projects and so forth, this would be uh, also peace building, but appropriate for the local levels. So my answer is a little bit long-winded, except to say that developing tools so that each place can look on a map, can go on a website and say, oh, I understand what this challenge means for me and for my community, uh, and then to help give a systematic voice to proper planning for what can be done is extremely important. And one network that I'm uh, putting together for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is called the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN. And it's a network mainly of universities and think tanks around the world to be working on technical issues of sustainable development in support of governments and the business community. And I would say that we would have a quite practical opportunity of OSCE and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network working together to say, let's mobilize the university network within the OSCE to work together also with the security community, by the way, and with the, uh, with the, the foreign policy community to look at how local and regional uh, environmental risks can be mitigated. Uh, and I would be very happy to uh, explore ways for the university network in the OSCE region to work together with the OSCE organizationally to give support to this kind of uh, localized problem solving as well. My uh, word to every university is you have to play a leadership role locally to make sure that the talent you have inside the university of engineers, hydrologists, uh, energy experts, uh, and so forth is brought to bear to study the local problems, not just to publish journal articles or to, uh, uh, to, to give classes, but also to work on local problem solving. Thank you, Professor. We, we have uh, taken good note of your uh, suggestions, and I think we'll take you up also on your offer of, uh, of um, uh, working, working together on, on developing this. Uh, we, we have a question uh, that came in via Twitter, um, and, and this is going back to the uh, energy issue. And the question is, uh, is nuclear energy a solution to climate change, in your view? I believe nuclear energy is uh, an essential part of decarbonization. 
Uh, it's also one that is obviously fraught with uh, lots of risks, uh, especially fissile materials uh, and also nuclear waste and nuclear accidents. But on the whole, the nuclear sector has been a safe energy sector. Uh, it certainly has contributed uh, much less to uh, global harm than the coal sector uh, in terms of uh, pollution, climate change, uh, and uh, deaths and morbidity. So I believe that the nuclear sector is an important, uh, nuclear energy sector is an important sector. And no matter what I believe, I think it's also clear that dozens of countries, probably three or four dozen countries, will choose the nuclear power option. Uh, certainly in East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, uh, will have nuclear energy. Uh, the UK, uh, of course, has just uh, signed with China an agreement for China to be one of the developers, together with EDF and others, of a new nuclear power facility in the UK. Uh, Europe is quite deeply divided on this. Uh, Germany says end completely nuclear energy. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, other countries are going to remain uh, nuclear energy countries. My own view is that decarbonization without nuclear power would be much, much more difficult and much more costly. My own view, from what I understand, uh, not as an authority on this, is that there are improved safety systems, uh, fourth generation nuclear energy, uh, and different fuel cell cycles uh, that could be adopted uh, also to address the nuclear waste issues and the uranium mining issues. Uh, integral uh, fast reactor technology, from what I understand, is quite promising. Um, and should have been pursued. Uh, the United States stopped its uh, integral fast reactor demonstration project in 1994 for no good reason. Um, and we have a very promising technology of an improved fuel cycle that, from my understanding, gives uh, less risk of uh, proliferation of uh, fissile materials, less risk of... Uh, uh, of uh, uh, nuclear waste, uh, improved passive safety systems uh, of the kind that we really need. So if there are power failures, tsunamis, and so forth, uh, an integral fast reactor turns off automatically. It doesn't depend on a backup uh, safety system of the kind that failed at Fukushima. Uh, and so my answer would be yes. But of course, uh, there's no way in the world that we're going to have a large-scale nuclear sector that's safe without a lot of uh, international cooperation, a very strong role of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, and uh, a very, very, very transparent amount of cooperation on the technologies and on the safety systems. And so we are deficient, deeply deficient, in that right now, and therefore the level of public distrust is profound. But uh, if the public were aware of how dangerous their coal plants are, as opposed to the nuclear plants, I think that they would uh, think again, but they would demand a much more transparent and safe system for making sure that nuclear energy remains peaceful and civilian. And it's a tough uh, road to, to follow, of course. This is, of course, a very uh, divisive issue here, here in Europe. Uh, I, I have to confess that personally I'm, I fully agree with you that if, we, if you were here we would be definitely in a minority in, in yeah. Europe. And, uh, I know. Uh, uh, I, but, I, I, but, uh, all over Europe don't like what I just said. I, so. take, I take your point. I take your point and I agree with it personally. Um, any, anybody else questions? Otherwise I, I will carry on with another uh, point on the... Uh, political military dimension. The question you, you heard earlier uh, was uh, from uh, a member of a delegation here, I, I, I suspect, that uh, is involved in the, in the political military side of, uh, of the work of the organization. 
And, uh, and, and we do realize that also the military look at the climate change, uh, uh, well, in various ways. In some ways, it might even be an opportunity or something to use. Uh, but in other ways, it's, it's a risk or it's a challenge to which the, the use of the traditional defense uh, tools doesn't really, uh, uh, how can I say, it's, it's not relevant to answer that. And certainly the national response is, is uh, inadequate because you also there you need to build the broader coalitions. So how can we try to use the political military dimension of the organization in addressing issues related to climate change? For instance, in the third leg, the disaster preparedness. Uh, that is an obvious area where we could try to, and that could be also a confidence building element, bringing uh, uh, countries together and the military together uh, to interact and to, and to cooperate to respond to disasters. Uh, maybe on the, on the resilience it may be more difficult, and, and before talking about decarbonizing armies, I think we should, uh, we should move, so, or conflicts, I think we should, uh, we should pace ourselves maybe a little bit. But starting talking about that may not be, may not be a bad thing. Uh, would you have any, any ideas or any advice in this, uh, uh, how, how to use this, this uh, uh, more, more narrow security dimension in the work of, uh, of the organization to also to mainstream or to, uh, to include some, some uh, issues related to, to climate change? Great. I think that there are uh, two things that I would uh, add to, uh, I'd like to just introduce uh, on this. One is uh, careful mapping of risks. The military is uh, usually quite good at uh, risk assessment um, instruments and uh, systematic threat assessments. And we need the same kind of systematic threat assessments when it comes to ecological threats uh, as uh, the military would gain uh, or exercise or analyze when it comes to uh, more traditional geopolitical and strategic threats. And I think uh, having uh, significant work on what kinds of shocks are possible, what does it mean to have a massive heat wave? What does it mean to have a three-year drought in the Middle East? Uh, what does it mean uh, to have uh, an extreme storm event or rising sea levels or other challenges? needs to be analyzed using tools that are uh, not unlike threat assessments uh, that are used uh, and, and developed uh, for more traditional military purposes. So this kind of uh, disaster response area can be made a lot more systematic by having a better mapping of what are the risks and the threats to natural disasters. And I have a team, for example, in my, in my own uh, um, uh, institute at uh, Columbia University, which is uh, expert in uh, GIS uh, systems analysis for looking at uh, local risks, whether it's flooding, flooding, droughts, or other hydro uh, meteorological uh, climate shocks. And we need to do more of that. And this is an area, again, where uh, OSCE, I, I think, could, could really contribute and the military could contribute. Mm -hmm. But a second point, uh, you mentioned about decarbonizing uh, the, the military uh, itself. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I think it's, uh, it's not going to be fully decarbonized, but uh, the U.S. Uh, military in a lot of ways actually is looking at uh, how to use uh, decentralized energy systems and especially falling prices of photovoltaics and, and other technologies for uh, its own operational uh, considerations. But I would say uh, one major point on this, which is that the, the biggest R&D budgets in the world are actually our biggest single uh, pockets of uh, R&D budgets uh, are our military R&D. Uh, this is the predominant uh, U.S. R&D budget. It, it's rivaled by biomedical research, but even some of that is uh, military uh, in nature. Mm -hmm. And in history, the military uh, technology sector has been actually the main uh, progenitor, I would say, of civilian technological breakthroughs in the last century. Why? Uh, because uh, wars lead to 
accelerated technologies, which then spin off uh, technologies for peace. And you could say that the computer industry was a spin off from uh, Belchley Park, uh, Enigma. You could say that uh, the radar uh, uh, laboratory was the progenitor of the semiconductor industry. Uh, you could say that a lot of public health today uh, built on the anti-malaria efforts uh, at Walter Reed Hospital uh, and so forth. It is actually a fact uh, of life that military technologies uh, become the progenitors often of the breakthrough civilian technologies. Mm -hmm. And I think it is not wrong, therefore, to ask the question of how the R&D uh, vast budgets uh, in the military sector Sorry. could be also dual use deployed for advancing the energy needs, the decarbonization needs, and so forth. And another uh, example of that is I mentioned that we have a, a unit that does GIS mapping, and it has a budget of some tens of millions of dollars a year, I suppose. But the biggest single uh, geographic mapping service in the world uh, is the geospatial unit of the National Intelligence uh, Agency of the United States. Uh, and it's a multi-billion dollar uh, mapping uh, facility. Of course, it's mapping where drones can fly uh, and uh, other kinds of security issues. But the information that it generates could give daily hazard uh, uh, advice, could give uh, disaster relief advice, could give development economic advice. And so I'm really appealing also to the intelligence agencies to open up their incredible technologies for development purposes. Uh, and the advances of GIS uh, capacities and GPS capacities, which again, GPS is a military technology uh, that was uh, made available for civilian use by the United States. We need to open these technology systems up for our uh, civilian development uses and uh, I really do appeal to the intelligence community, which spends a lot of money and has uh, unrivaled uh, big data capacities to turn this uh, to develop sustainable development uses uh, in a very directed and conscious way because the capacities are huge and they're underdeveloped from the point of view of uh, civilian use. Okay, well, there's quite a few military in the, in the room, so it's good, I think, that they heard also uh, your, your points. Um, a, a kind of related question, and we'll close on this if you have a few, few more minutes. Uh, it, it's, as we, uh, on the broader agenda of the organization, we see a need for us also to develop partnerships with actors that go beyond the intergovernmental uh, sector, and so engaging with industry, corporate, uh, private sector in many areas. How does it relate to, to the, uh, for instance, how do you see a uh, role uh, for, uh, for this kind of broader format in the, in the climate security uh, uh, nexus? Uh, should we make an effort to reach out to other actors? A absolutely, it's essential. And you know, because it's the core work of OSCE, that organization and uh, networking is very time consuming, very complicated, very expensive. And so it's a huge public good to create this kind of networking and therefore looking to other apex networks to say, look, we've got to cooperate to solve these problems is of a paramount uh, strategy. And one network that I uh, partner with closely is the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, which is the preeminent business group worldwide to work on challenges of bringing the business community into sustainable development. So they have lots of meetings like the one that you're having, but of business leaders. If OSCE and the World Business Council uh, connect and say, look, we're working on uh, in the same places uh, and now on similar problems, but from a slightly different point of view, how can we uh, make our, our mutual work uh, work better? I think it would be very fruitful. 
And the network that I want to bring into this mix is the World University Network, where a lot of the technical expertise and certainly the training of future leaders is going to come. Uh, and I think that those kinds of partnerships can be tremendously important in allowing us to move these uh, very difficult, complicated systems in the right direction. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Uh, you, you left us with lots of very interesting ideas. I would like to thank you. It was a really interesting, stimulating talk, uh, uh, serious issues on the agenda uh, of the international community. We'll discuss now among ourselves, continue discussion, see how this, uh, does this relate to the agenda of our organization. But we are uh, certainly very encouraged and very inspired by your words. Thank you very much thank for spending you. some time with us. We'll connect shortly after and uh, follow up. But thank you very much for letting me be part thank of you. today's meeting. Thank you.